Thanks for listening to The Derivative. This podcast is provided for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as legal, business, investment, or tax advice. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of RCM Alternatives, their affiliates, or companies featured. Due to industry regulations, participants on this podcast are instructed not to make specific trade recommendations nor reference past or potential profits, and listeners are reminded that managed futures, commodity trading, and other alternative investments are complex and carry a risk of substantial losses. As such, they are not suitable for all investors. Welcome to The Derivative by RCM Alternatives, where we dive into what makes alternative investments go, analyze the strategies of unique hedge fund managers, and chat with interesting guests from across the investment world. So there's a real rubber meets the road aspect of this in that option, you know, the option traders just over time, they're not, you know, they're not going to overpay for those options. The VIX can't go to a hundred and stay there. It can go to a hundred over a month. It could go to 10,000 over a month, but the market moves that are, would be necessary to justify a hundred VIX, it'd have to move like a eight percent a day like it just that can't be sustained with and if i also think about it this way a long vix is a really nice s p hedge it's unreasonable to expect that someone's going to take on your s p risk for free and so unlike an option the vix doesn't decay so if you bought some puts you would be paying this daily decay for that insurance but if you bought a VIX, it it doesn't have that decay. And in essence, that's what that contango represents. Hello, listeners and watchers. I see you, YouTubers. Uh, we haven't had a VIX specialist on in a while or an options guy. Um, we also haven't had a trend follower on in a while. Um, I'm ignoring Howard Lindzen, whose version of trend following last week wasn't quite what we would call trend following. Uh, but anyway, I think we found the perfect guest to kill those two birds with one stone today. We've got Scott Billington, the co-founder and managing partner of Covenant Capital Management, uh, on with us today to dish on his journey from option trader to trend follower to volatility specialist. Welcome, Scott. Uh, welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, looking forward to it. So, yeah, we've known each other too long now, maybe 20 years now. Frighteningly close. <laughs> right. Let's um, pretend it's less, but it's probably more. We'll pretend it's less. So when I was a young futures broker and uh, we came out to your house there, I don't know if you're still in the same house, but uh, I don't think there so, in Naperville but... and you had the, the uh, half Kentucky basketball court. You still got that? Ah, uh, we still do. So we are in the same house, indeed. Yeah. Yes. That was uh, amazing. So right, it's above the garage, and it's almost a full scale half court. Almost, it's about a third of a court. And oddly enough, the my older sons have both gone off to college, and it had turned into a climbing gymnastics adventure room for my daughter. But just this week, she decided to start playing basketball. So we moved a lot of her stuff back out of the way and reconverted it into a basketball court. Nice. So, and so you get a lot like, of action over the years. You can shoot full three pointers and whatnot you in can there? Two threes for about, you know, now the baselines are probably only 10 feet, but you can shoot threes from almost the 45 degree angles across the top of the key. Nice. And that, and in the center or whatever, what would be the center is the University of Kentucky logo. Indeed it is. So that's your alma mater, I'm assuming? It is not. I grew up in Kentucky, grew up a huge Kentucky sports fan. I'm not alone in that from the state. You know, there are no pro teams. Uh, they were always better, much better basketball. But recently they've had a little rejuvenation in football. And I would say I am – a big enough fan that I even watched a lot of the women's volleyball team won the national championship last year. So really, nice. UAN, Kentucky, uh, Sydney McLaughlin, the Olympic gold medal, 400 meter rela or 400 meter hurdle star. Yeah. From Tokyo also went to Kentucky. So I am uh, any Kentucky sports. I'm, I'm not allergic to any of them. I love it. And remind me your alma mater. So my alma mater is uh, Miami of Ohio. Oh, Ohio. 
the Kentucky of Ohio. Um, <laughs> we, the, <laughs> perhaps it was a popular school. It actually had come out in a book called Public Ivies back in the late eighties when I was graduating high school. And actually one of my kids is going there now. So it's kind nice. of fun to go back and see the old spots. Not a ton has changed in old Oxford. It's got a little bit of a back to the future feel. So I was just talking with a guy who went to my alma mater union college and they've put a uh, oh. rivers casino, like literally it would have been two blocks from my freshman dorm. So I suspect that, that would have been, been trouble. Been the best thing. <laughs> yeah, that was that's not a rosy outcome by for right. anybody in that case and they're i think they're asking like 60k a year or something now to be a freshman there i'm like sixty thousand a year to be 200 feet from a, a casino doesn't seem like a good a good mix no um so two then, ways to lose sixty thousand in a year right or you got to add like a five thousand dollar marker to the the <laughs> tuition right it's room or marker yeah. at the casino um so Somewhere in there, I don't know the whole backstory, actually, having known you for so long, but between college and you ended up at the CBOE uh, trading in options. The, so what was in that? Between that, I lived in Nashville, Tennessee for a decade. A almost. decade? Yeah. Okay. I got my start in futures there. I worked for a regional investment bank, J.C. Bradford. Bradford, company. that's right. It's coming back to me now. Uh, did some work in commercial hedging under you know, for JC Bradford, what was one of the larger producers. And uh, that's actually where we de I developed the first models that later became Covenant Capital's trend following models. Yeah. And once we started Covenant, then I moved back to Chicago and worked in the option pits while Covenant got its legs under it and got some AUM. I was just looking at a great thread. Uh recently on Twitter of the guys saying you need a war chest three to five years because you're going to have a uh, yeah right, a period where you're not earning enough in fees or revenue to survive. But that's the other method, right? Of like, have a, have a day job, so to speak. Well, we were zero and 20 also annually. So yeah. there Ooh. was, and you know, when you start out, not shockingly, you don't have a lot of money and the models were very low maintenance. We had two partners and, we were easily able to handle the trades while I traded down on the floor. Yeah. yeah. So I'll come back to the floor in a minute, but I'm always right. You meet a lot of interesting people that came up through JC Bradford. Like what, what happened to them? What they're not still around, are they? Yeah. They sold out to Dean Witter. Okay. So uh, they sold out Dean Witter needed to buy them for UBS to buy Dean Witter. It was mm. a total Russian dolls scenario. And UBS wanted Dean Witter to have X amount of brokers or X amount of assets to buy them. And they bought Bradford across that finish line. And, but it was mainly uh, grown in the ground commodity hedging and working with actual and farmers, but then a lot of speculators as well. <laughs> All the hedgers were speculators. Yes. Right? We call them hedge edulators. Yes. Uh, we worked at first. It was a lot of cotton hedging. Memphis was a bit of a hub. My yep. biggest client was a big merchant in Europe. And uh, it, towards the end of the, my time there, we did a lot of natural gas and oil hedging. So yeah. it was really those two things. I worked under a guy who had all the biz, you know, the business and, and in essence was his right-hand man. And yeah. how, how cool it was it back at the time of like, they didn't need to call you for quotes, place orders, right? There was no screens. There was no. There's no screen. Well, back then I remember him being not thrilled that we had to charge $25 round turn commissions. Yeah. That's, <laughs> That's the hedger too. Yeah. Oh, that was, those were for commercial. Like he was getting 50 around turn was very common. And that doesn't even include the bid ass spread. Right. And in fact, a lot of that went into my original, you know, cornerstone of anybody that's thinking about doing any trading. As I can remember, I would add up the P and L's of our clients, and I'd think, "Oh, so and so, they lost a hundred grand." And I'd look over, and I'd be like, "Oh, they paid us one hundred twenty in commission." Yeah, they well, don't need to trade better; they just need a cheaper broker. Yeah, yeah. And that doesn't even include the massive bid ask spreads they were paying every time they came in. So, 
And then did that inform you a little bit also of like, hey, these people are, right, it's always hard for people to understand, like, why would anyone want to lose money, right, for trend following to work, for some of these models to work, you need someone on the other side, it's a zero sum game, uh, that's sort of willing to lose money. It's interesting you bring that up, because that is going to be, you've stolen a bit of my thunder for right. anticipating <laughs> later. But uh, yes, when you look at it, you have to think, it is a zero sum game. Someone is going to have to lose this money that I make and, and sort of not care or, and theoretically the hedgers are gaining it. You know, you're taking risk on for them that you can't be expected to take that risk for free. Right. And much of, or some of what they're losing in the futures markets, theoretically they're making in the cash markets. So uh, perhaps that's an explanation for, you know, some net pool of edge that trend followers can dip into. Yeah. People smarter than you and me um, have the, uh, there's a term for it, economic incentive or dissentive or something, right? There's a, there's a technical term for it of like, these are different, yes. these different participants have different um, path dependencies. They have different okay. outlooks. And that certainly applies to the option markets. And I don't want to get ahead of us, but that applies to them tenfold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And have you hedged, you know, if you and I trade an option and I hedge it and you don't, we can both easily make money or both easily lose money. And even the way in which we hedge it or the time frame on which we hedge it can make very significant differences on that trade outcome. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, we'll come back to that. So I, I want to, but speaking of options, so you're 30-ish, you're going down to the CBOE? 30-ish, go down to the CBOE, start out as a clerk, which is basically a fraternity pledge. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like three years older than my bosses. They are calling me every name in the book. And I'm just thinking like, what am I do? like? <laughs> some guys like poking me in the chest. Uh, I worked for a small group. They, you know, some of the groups down there were just big and would physically muscle in on orders. Mm -hmm. Other groups were more cerebral. And, and luckily for me, I was in more of the latter. So uh, we did not, even then, this is 2002, did not use computers. So we had physical sheets in the pit. I was just going to give the, uh, there it is. Oh yeah. Right? They were in the top pocket like this right there. And any options guy was, and, and so what, what was on those sheets? So it would have, we would have, I was an OEX pit, but you know, it would have underlying future price and then all the surrounding strikes values and then all the corresponding Greeks. And the thing that Sheets did that other people just had a box, a computer, and then mm -hmm. they had one person who understand options theory and they're pumping the values through. And if you're on a, if you're on a box, you're going to see, you know, 760 and you're going to go, oh, I'm 730 at 780 or whatever. Yeah. So I want to buy it at 730 or sell it at 780. Yes. Yeah. On the Sheets, we had to understand underlying option theory quite a bit more. We had to make adjustments. You know, the phraseology would be, uh, these are trading two days out, which meant there was two days of decay out of the values. Mm -hmm. so we had something worth 440 and there was 20 cents of decay a day. New value is 400. And by your sheet showing 440? Yeah, it's one. So you had to, had to know. know I'm, and then, then the other ads would say, hey, we're at sheets. So that means you're offering the sheet. And then at times, if the market moved so much, we might have to rerun the entire 200 sheet thing and bring them back out to everybody. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That makes sense. So, you know, as a trader, it did make you l learn a lot more about options, volatility, and understanding how these prices were moved instead of just being spoon-fed a, a digit. 
And then that makes two, sense. Yeah, yeah. And two questions that did everyone from the different groups have the same numbers on their sheets? Was everyone coming to the same conclusions or They're was all it coming to about the same conclusion? Yeah. So it wasn't. I, mean, I mean, in the in the pit, not you know, you're gonna have some differences. And and like our the guys that ran our group, and like we probably had an eight-person group, they would trade a lot of time spreads and they would trade them a lot of times with some of the big groups, you know, more or less saying, Hey, we think there's some edge there that CTC or Knight or whomever were the big people yeah. there. Don't Wolverine was another big one for the straight values of the options. You're within a dime and, and 20 cents. And it just depends on how aggressively you want to be buying or selling them. So they're, they're going to end up pretty similar, but there is a speed aspect that you're having to make these adjustments. I mean, I would do 4,000 subtraction problems in my head a day, just yeah, yeah. do the spreads and stuff like that, that, that was challenging. Obviously the computer was better, but, <laughs> but uh, I do remember sitting there thinking, why are we all standing here? Like it's the 1600s. Yeah. <laughs> One computer server could do this far better than all of us for better for everyone. Yeah. And yet we're standing here like it's an open market in, in William Wallace is going to stroll up. <laughs> like, like it's insane. But, you know, I think the old adage is like the last sailing ship sailed 60 years after the steam engine was created. Mm -hmm. It does take time for people to adapt. And, you know, the entrenched power of the value of the seat and the money you can make as a broker and a market maker, guys that are making, they, obviously they don't want to give that up, you know, so. And so the, and I, people get confused about this. Um, so it wasn't in the value of your numbers. It wasn't like a statistical edge down there. It was in the value of you being a trader, right? Of knowing. The bid -ass spread. No, it's right. just, the value is the bid ask spread. If it's worth 720 and I'm seven bid at 740, that's 20 cents on either side. And if you do that a hundred um, times a day, you're having a good day. Well, and then that's 20 cents times a hundred. Yeah. Because each option is a hundred shares. So every option is 20 bucks. If I trade a thousand options a day, it's yeah. 20 grand, then I got to spend five grand getting rid of reinsuring my own risk. Mm -hmm. Think about it that way. It's a lot, you know, I got to explain like, but it's a lot of money. I mean, I mean, big traders would trend might trade 10,000 a day. And, and, you know, I was definitely, I was not down there a super long time. I'm, I'm far from, you know, the Nigerian or whatever. Although I do remember those guys that are on CNN yeah. now were down there when I, you know, they were just starting their TV careers. You're far uh, from Nigerian full stop. You don't have the, the ponytail, the Jack. Yeah, the whole thing. <laughs> Dr. J I think was, is an acronym, but we, uh, you know, I was not down there a long time, was certainly not a big fry or anything, but, but it is an experience. I mean, it's really kind of fun to be honest. Like well, it's just a bunch of guys yucking it up down there most of the day. Talking yeah, it's like, points. well, you are in the, basically in the NFL, right? Right. Of trading, right? That's, it doesn't get any higher really level. athletes, but sure. Yeah. I don't think I would give us quite that much credit, <laughs> but it, you know, it was much more, it was much closer to like a fraternity television room than it was to a job that you might imagine is a job. Yeah, yeah. And they right. would bet, like there was a bet on how many Krispy Kreme donut, like Krispy Kreme opened up across the street. And there was a bet on how many donuts this clerk could eat in an hour or whatever, half hour. And I mean, there ends up being like hundreds of thousands of dollars bet on this dude jamming donuts down his throat. <laughs> the two least athletic guys in the pit would get an argument about who's faster. And I mean, they look like two penguins running down an alley, but <laughs> You'd all bet on it and go out there and watch them. So I mean, or the famous one over at the Merck was if you could throw a football across the river, right? Yeah. And so, so, they all, or, have, or they'd uh, pay the clerks to jump into the river, like yes. you know, in Swim December. Right. So there's all the same things, and and you know, 
I was single, you know, young person. It's, it's all, I mean, it's 98% male. So you're really talking about a bunch of young men, frontal lobes, only semi-formed. Yeah. Not shockingly, <laughs> there was a lot of silliness that went on. Oh, uh, right. A lot of, lot of drugs, a lot of that nonsense. So good to see that you kept it together in that regard. I did keep it quite clean when I would go out with my friends. I generally caught the train back to Naperville, the 1130. Which um, is, those are good stories. Of have people wanted to get out of there. There's a whole bevel of those stories, right? Of uh, people who missed the last train yeah. and the, the taxis would line up and they'd know they had no choice. And they'd charge yeah. them like three, four, 500 bucks to go out to the suburbs. Um, so that's fun. Maybe was, uh, enlightening and enjoyable. You know, I'm, I only caught the tail end of it. You know, I think the late nineties was probably at the CBOE was, was probably the biggest, you know, boom time, but it was still, you know, I was in the OEX pit. There were a hundred and something guys in our pit, a hundred and something guys in the Dow pit. Yeah. It was adjacent. And now I think there's like, a computer server and two dudes reading a newspaper. Yeah. So, <laughs> which is depressing, right? Like where does this next level of, of CTA of hedge fund manager of trader come from when they don't get that experience, right? When they don't flow through that ecosystem. Yeah. I don't know. The, the number of entry level jobs is been eviscerated. Yeah. But I and or you need a, a degree from Cal and quantum yeah. finance or something, right? You can't be some, Mo from Miami of Ohio, no offense, and be like, hey, I, I'm hungry okay. and I want to show up and get the job done. The uh, It really took the route of most industries. If you think about like Walmart bankrupted all the local hardware stores because they yeah. would sell more stuff for less margin. Well, Citadel and GetGo, I mean, now they just front run, but like they basically trade more and more contracts for less and less bid ask spread. Yeah. So it, it's really the same thing. It comes down to who will do it for the, who can be efficient and, and will do it for the least amount of edge or profit margin. You know, if you're selling widgets, it'd be profit margin. And if you're trading futures or options, it's bid ask spread. That is the profit margin for the market maker. So Whoever I mean, will do the volume and can do it efficiently is going to take over the market and squeeze all the small players out. I mean, it's really, I think, ultimately pretty similar to many, if not most, industries. We had a trader come in with a proposal of creating some structure that could basically go back into the pit because he's like, all these big firms just have their computer number. And sometimes there's a big spread and they just pass on it because they have these really super tight parameters that their traders are just uh, instructed to stick to, right? They're like, don't go off program. You just trade this all day, every day, like you're saying. Yeah. We make the money in all this volume. You, you do this all day, every day. And he's like, there's, you know, super highway lanes wide yeah. trades that come every now and then they get passed by. It may be the case. I know, I, I know a couple of old contacts from the floor who I keep in contact, you know, a couple of them are doing some like energy spreads along the same theory where they get, you know, that's not frequent enough for Citadel or whomever to bother making a market in it. And it ends up with a, or it's esoteric enough and it ends up with a human market maker who can make a bit ass spread wide enough to make it worth the while. Right. So, Back to I, your I, thing, right? There's, it. There's probably still a bookstore somewhere that sells like a yeah. very specific set of books on whatever or, model airplane building or something. Or if you've got a bookstore and a cheap enough rent and and look, bookstores are still fun to go to. Yeah. And if if you like someone and trust them and you're kind of like, eh, I'd rather come talk to this person. I love their recommendations and the books five ninety nine instead of four ninety nine on Amazon. Really, that dollar's gonna bust me. No. There are little niches like that. And again, you, you've obviously done these interviews before. You're stealing more of my thunder of later. <laughs> but that's in essence what we've done is tried to go find a niche that's big enough for the Billington family to enjoy, but small enough that Goldman Sachs is never going to bother. 
Yeah, yeah. It literally would cost them more to set up a desk than they can make from it. And it's, that's a nice analogy. So you're doing the options, you're doing this covenant, the trend following model. Well, you, you started at JC Bradford. Um, how did that start? How did it end? What was the middle like? Well, we it started with, I'm a terrible salesperson <laughs> and I wasn't ever going to be able to make a living as a broker. Okay. And, and you're, you're too honest and direct would be my, <laughs> no, no, yeah. I'm not. I, I don't have enough courage. is is the problem. So I figured if I was going to be able to apply any value, I was going to have to have some way to have ultimately non-random trades. So in my opinion, there's a a truly losing method is by definition as rare as a truly winning method. Because a losing method is just the opposite side of a winning one, which means that 99% 99% of the trading that has to be done out there is, is just random. I think XYZ has some uh, implication about future market prices, but it really doesn't. It doesn't mean that it is the opposite of what I think. It just means that it's random. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so, the, uh, I think it's Michael Malbusen's book, right? The, uh, something with skill like the to define skill is it can you lose on purpose yeah that's exactly exactly he's yeah. put it far better than i just did yeah. four words and it took me one stumbling paragraph but yes <laughs> so we uh when i looked at that I, you know i distinctly remember i pulled out the barclays top 20 ctas over the past 10 years and this is in 1996 or 7 And I think 15 of them described themselves as long-term trend following. So then when I thought about the part of costs, trading costs, I thought, okay, so trading costs are my, are the net, that's the, that's the admission price that Mm -hmm. I have to pay to play. And by the way, I should, there are, you know, people will, Look, brokerage, have, they all provide a service that is necessary and they take on risk and, and people should not expect them to do it for free by any means. But basically, trading costs are in my control because I don't incur them when I don't trade. Right. And so the larger, the smaller my gross outcome is, the bigger effect. My, tra- my trading cost is fixed, whether I hold something for a day or six months. Right. So I right? might not hold it for my, six months. Yeah. Well, my simple, my grow, I mean, there are reasons you wouldn't, but my gross cost is going to be very dependent on, on how long I hold something. Right. And so I'm basically like, okay, the amount of non-randomness I need to break even equals trading costs. So if I keep trading costs smaller, that means I can be profitable with less non-randomness yeah yeah i hope you've read a book that can state that in a clear <laughs> way that i that i just did i have but it's not coming to top of mind so okay. we'll leave it there so i started trying to develop very long-term trend following models and i mean looking back it's absurd but more or less came up with one that i thought worked and in back tested or whatever and went out to try to find some business capital to run the business and some client capital to invest. And so Brent Wilford, who at the time was one of my best friends in Nashville, had made some money and said, well, I want to invest in this business. And his dad and my dad and one of my hedger clients were our first three accounts. And then in a very proud moment, my dad closed his account like six months in. <laughs> Which Brent's used to like. I think Brent's kept a running total for almost a decade of how much that cost him. But uh, yes, it kept reminding him at every yeah. cocktail party. So off we went. And uh, I think, you know, we struggled our first year right out of the gate. So we had a contingency plan in case of emergency break glass. We had to break the glass. And what the note inside said, Scott, go get another job. Yeah. <laughs> and so then <laughs> I went and traded 
uh, options. That was fun. Learned a lot. And then we had three or four real blowout, extraordinarily good years there. Left the pit, came back to Covenant trend following full time. And, you know, in our top assets under management, we'd taken that first 750 grand. And I think we were probably 400 million yeah. assets. It's not bad working out of Nashville, yeah. Tennessee, no Harvard degrees, no, you know, none of our dads were partners at Goldman to exactly. like, you know, we, we, worked hard to get that and we both stunk at selling. So it was, we made it particularly difficult. And was um, it the same model throughout or it, it got it certainly and upgraded? Ev- it certainly evolved. You know, we certainly made changes to it, but the, the basic underlying structure really never changed. Yeah, we were always try to be, we don't, I mean, to this day, we don't think that I'm going to find some trinket that's going to be able to predict where the market's going. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, I got to have something that says the market started going up and I need to buy it. And I got to have something that says that's enough loss. I got to get out. Yeah. Then some risk parameter. I mean, it's really not that much to it. And, and to this day, I would argue vehemently I highly doubt you've got some auto learning AI, whatever, whatever cutting edge stuff that is really predicting tomorrow's market move. I, you know, I I don't know. I've never seen maybe Renaissance capital. I've never seen any performance that would suggest that. Well, and at best they're even, and we've had AI people on the potty of the, it's saying there's a 63% chance that tomorrow is up. So you need how many years or, you know, you need a huge sample size. Even if it is correct, it needs a huge sample size to prove correct. And I don't doubt it's been correct in the past. Yeah. Right. And I don't doubt if we took a thousand of them, that 12 of them would be successful over the next five years. But if they were random, 12 of them would be successful over the next five years. So, you know, anyways, uh, you know, I was looking at it before we got on here, our aggressive program, which was our most popular program, it ran for 15 years and it compounded at 12 and a half percent a year after fees compounded annual return over those 15 years with the worst drawdown being less than 30%. Yeah. Was a That's start. pretty good. Um, That's pretty good. Like you go out there and look around again, Market makers, yes, but that's only because they get to do thousands of trades a day. For any position taking, it's pretty good, you know. Yeah. And I, positive skew and long volatility as well. Right? Positive like skew, can... long vol- and you know that's also because obviously, like most, it closed on a low. Yeah, you yeah, know. Yeah. So, but even with that, you got one and a half time market return. And the market had two 50% drawdowns in that period. And I think our worst was 27. So, yeah. with, you know, I'll throw out a percent of the risk. You got one and a half times the return in a non-correlated asset. That's pretty good. Or I, I don't know. I don't want to sprain my shoulder, pat myself on the back. <laughs> I'm pretty proud of what we were able to do with that. And I think it does suggest some of our ideas had some validity. Yeah. And so let's talk. I'll throw out a quick past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results. Uh, Disclaimer. Those are um, also programs are closed. They're not offered. Yeah. Yeah. All in retrospect. So. But let's talk about that. So why did they close? I know the answer, but your version of the answer of did the models break? Did the investors lose patience? Combination of the two. Well, the investors are always and, and probably should going to lose patience before there's enough data to suggest this does isn't going to work in the future. I mean, the the ultimately in all this investing, the problem is is that the standard deviation is m- way larger than the drift. Yeah, and so you're going to have wild swings. Uh, we changed 
twofold. One, we had a three-year drawdown. So that is going to put us business-wise in a very difficult situation. And we lost the gross majority of our assets. So, and secondly, trend following, and, th and this was probably as, if not more important, trend following had become commoditized. Mm -hmm. So you had a lot of very good, very big groups offering trend at one and zero. Yeah. Or I think you can get it like on a bank platform, you can get a, um, right, the, uh, I can't remember the name right now, but you can just the return. You are, I don't know if they're still, I haven't followed it. Yeah, yeah. But ultimately it got very risk commoditized. Premium is the word I was looking for. You can just yeah. say on their risk premium platform, give me trend for 45 bips. Or whatever. Yeah. So, you know, could we do it better than that? Does it even matter? I, I mean, it. Yeah, some years. If, yes. if I'm arguing, you know, if somebody says, hey, there's 77 PhDs at Merrill Lynch have created this thing and I can get it for 45 basis points. Yeah. <laughs> go get them. I mean, I can't, you know, there are advantages. I mean, those things, when they get that big, they end up being currency, interest yeah. rate. They, you don't get the commodity exposure just because they're not big enough to be able to trade $30 billion in at a certain size. But you know, you're, we're, that's why, you know, the two things coincided. If it hadn't been commoditized, then, like, I still think trend following is a viable trading strategy. I don't think it will do as well over the next 20 years that it did for the 20 years up to, say, 2014 or 30 years up to that because it's a crowded space or because no, I just think it, over, it got, I, I always think about it like this. Whenever anybody goes in to look for a trading strategy, it's almost impossible not to get swept up in a survivorship bias. So if you imagine, let's imagine there are four trading strategies that are profitable and you and I are looking at a 20 year period, and let's say all four equal in their actual efficacy. Mm -hmm. One of the four has done one and a half to two deviations better than the other four. Well, guess which one we're gonna find? Yeah, yeah. And then guess what it's gonna do over the next 20 years? The deviations are huge. This is a deviation and a half, maybe even two deviations to the good, even if it just goes back to its expectancy, we're going to see a massive drop in efficacy. Does that make sense? Yep. And so you always find the thing that has probably been outperforming its future expected performance, even if you test and do everything properly. You see, Which is, you to me right? reminds me. Reminds me right now just of the S and P, right? Like how much sure. trillions of dollars flowing into the S and P of like, what you, you could, stupid? Why are you looking at all these alpha strategies? Just invest in the S and P. Well, or you could even and that argument could be made on index investing versus non-index investing. Yeah, it it isn't to say one is better than the other. It it, it I'll say this, and I think this can be this is a very easy to defend statement. Whatever's been doing the best has been outperforming its expectation, not it's that much better. Yeah, These yeah. are very competitive markets. And it's, it's going to revert. It's almost impossible to be that much better. It's like, uh, did you watch the golf tournament this weekend? I did not, but. So this dude makes eight 25 footers to win. Yeah. No. Here's a newsflash. He just got, he's a great putter. I'm not, he got lucky. Who was it? Um, Cantley. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He makes a bunch and he beats DeChambeau in a playoff, but he, he does make a bunch of 15 plus footers. And even the pros only make those 13% of the time. Yeah. So like golf analytics show that the winners of tournaments are lucky putters for that week. The top money winners hit their approach shots the best and their drives the farthest. And the putting works itself out. Yeah. And the putting. Yes. That you, you see what I mean? And, and so 
whoever won this week is the same as whatever trader, investment, whatever happened to have done the best over the last five, even 10 years. The variances are still, they're extraordinary versus the drift. And I'll one up you on that of the, the for, right, for you, for, for you guys to survive uh, on the trend, you have survived, but if you had kept the trend following going, right, it would have been like, hey, we need to tilt long bias. Hey, we need to add more equity exposure. Yeah. We need to do a few of these things that would have made those past 10 years better. Yes. And but then, then you're you just even... making it up. I mean, you're not, then you're lying. I, I mean, yeah. but, it, but happened. even then you, and again, it's very tempting to say, oh, I'm going to tweak this model so that it gets in S&P trends easier and doesn't get out on X drop. I'm going to stay and I add on this. Right. Yeah. And, and always buy you know, on Wednesdays at 10 a.m., right? right? Like, yeah, you can go crazy. So we didn't, you know, ultimately our decision to leave trend was business. It had been commoditized and we expected it to do less well over the next 20 years, even take out the cold period, yeah. less well over the next 20 years than it had from 94 to 2014, let's say. Um, were you tempted? Did you spin it up and see what it did end of last year? Because last year and the beginning of this year would have been great for trend followers. I'm sure you guys would have crushed it. I'm sure it would have done very well. And that's great. I, I mean, yeah. trading is really hard. It's a huge net negative for your limbic brain system because everything in the world shows that losses are worse. Losses make you sadder than gains make you happy. Yeah. So I do try to do if one of the gifts I give myself is to not go back and see, oh, how would have trend done? Right. I can only cause myself more pain. <laughs> right. Plenty of that to go around as is. I don't right. need to drum up anymore. <laughs> I hear you. Uh, so let's go on. So you made that decision. Kudos for that. And well, I'll also say is that we'd begun developing these volatility systems. You know, we started researching them in 16 and 15 and 16. They were good and, and we liked them a lot. So the other and probably most important piece of leading trend is we had something we thought we could go to that was, that was good. Not only the models were good, we felt the theory behind it was strong and it was this niche. We could be the bookstore that people really liked. Yeah, yeah. And there was reason to believe that the total volume in the VIX is small enough that it, it just doesn't make sense for Citadel to go in there. So I don't think I've found anything that those people haven't found. It, they there just are not the number of contracts where it makes any sense. Now, they're, they'll market make there, but I mean, position take. So let's dive into that. So you guys switched, you shelved trend following. You yes. had another reservation at another good restaurant, so to speak, and turned on the volatility models. So what do yep. those look like? What's the, there's a few different programs now. So let's, however you want to lay it out. Well, so the, Volatility programs, the oldest running one is called Total Volatility. It analyzes the VIX term structure and is, you know, looking at contango and backwards. And when that spread is wide enough, it is going to take positions in the VIX and then the same position in the S&P. So you're going to be short both or long both. Got it. Front month looking at front month to cash contango because the VIX has a pretty simple future has to equal cash at settlement period mm -hmm. by law. Yeah. So if the future's at 18 and the cash is at 15, there's $3,000 a contract. If nothing happens, that should come in. Although there's some arguments over whether that was uh gamed that cash settlement but we'll leave that we'll leave that there for now. we don't have we don't hold them all the way to cash settlement so yeah. that we do that is not a game we want to play but that's the fundamental underpinning mm -hmm. of what we're looking at 
And the thing I like best about it is nowhere in there did it say Scott Billington can figure out where the market or where Vol's going. <laughs> right. In fact, it really adheres to a, the market is right. And if the market's right, nothing should happen. And that should, that 18 should go down and meet that 15. So the next question is, well, what if the 15 goes up to meet the 18? Mm -hmm. And while that certainly could happen in a given month and over a year, but if the cash continuously went up to the future, that would mean that the price of options would be perpetually rising. Right, because that vol yeah. would have to go up, and it would be hard for the future to not also rise when the option price. Even if even if the fifteen eighteen, and you say, oh well, let's say the future doesn't go down, the cash goes up. Okay, well now the cash is at eighteen. Next month it's twenty eighteen. Mm -hmm. It goes up again. Okay, it's well now start doing that over years. The cash vix, the market is not. You know, the cash vix is a. There's a very rubber meet the road aspect of that. So if the 15 goes to the 18. That tech, that shouldn't happen over long periods of time because the because options market the cash works. volatility would have to be perpetually rising. Yeah, yeah. And and it the market doesn't move enough to justify that. Those insurance premiums are not that high. So there's a real rubber meets the road aspect of this in that option. You know, the option traders. Just over time, they're not, you know, they're not going to overpay for those options. The VIX can't go to 100 and stay there. Yeah. It can go to 100 over a month. It could go to 10,000 over a month. But the market moves that are, would be necessary to justify 100 VIX, it'd have to move like 8% a day. Yeah, it could go to zero at that point. Two years, right. Like it just, that can't be sustained. And if I also think about it this way, a long VIX is a really nice S&P hedge. It's, un, it's unreasonable to expect that someone's going to take on your S&P risk for free. And so unlike an option, the VIX doesn't decay. So if you bought some puts, you would be paying this daily decay for that insurance. But if you bought a VIX, it, it doesn't have that decay. And in essence, that's what that contango represents. Does right. that make it's sense? Like, well, it's like pre-decayed sort of, is how I would think of it, right? Well, so when you buy it at 18 and it decays to 15, it's going to have to mimic an option decay or no one would buy puts. Right, right. You see what I mean? Like those two hedges are going to be competing for hedge dollars. And so their costs are going to have to be similar. And I don't mean this week or next week or next quarter, or even next year, but over the next decade, they're going to have to be similar. And so it sounds like everything you're saying is you have a short vol tilt, but that's not true at all, right? It's not a short vol tilt. I, I, the jet, it is the argument as to why the general, the usual VIX term structure is going to be contango. It's why I would be willing to bet that. Right. And it's also the argument as to why this future is decaying into the cash rather than vice versa. And so your that's normal it. normal trade in that scenario would be short, short? Now, if that sets up, then in total vol, we would trade that short, short. So we're going to be short the S&P. We're going to be short the VIX. And, you know, theoretically, we're agnostic as to which way the market goes. Yeah. We're probably, there's a, we're probably against market speed, but I mean, actually a slow grinding down market is gonna probably be the best. We're gonna have a good chance to win both ways on that. Mm -hmm. But what we're gonna look at is, I, do I have a big enough head start in the contango to cover the anticipated variance of this pair? 
Have I explained that even close to clearly? I uh, I understand it, but uh, I think it's like good. that pair is going to move all yeah. over the place. And obviously, if the cash was at ten and the future was at forty that cushion is going to be able to absorb enormous amounts of movement. Oh, yeah. And if the cash is at 12 and the future's at 1203, yeah, that no. cushion is not going to be able to withstand barely any movement. So somewhere in there, we say, okay, that's enough. This is worth taking the risk. And a big part of the program is being in cash a lot of the time, right? So not well, yeah, we do not. We're certainly, if there a position is not available, we're not going to take one. And what, so there's a few of these types of strategies out there. Some have even gone out of business yep. last year, 2020. So how does it differ? I know you don't know their inside out, but it's kind of was shown to be a very tough strategy towards the end of 2020. Well, it, it wasn't awesome. You know, frankly, the short, short, which is kind of the mainstay position has not done well since 2019. Mm -hmm. it, it has not done very well at all. Um, Which is partly because vol is remaining elevated, right? It's not selling I mean, off as much as the market's the, rallying. I mean, well, you know, pre that vol get in early 18, vol had gotten so low that- yeah, you, that you didn't have that spread. And that cash can, you know, when we're at nine and 11, that cash can wander up to 11. And then we're at 11 and nine or, or 11 and 1150. And okay, it wanders, you know, now the, the VIX cash also has a hard floor. Yeah. Somewhere above zero. Now yeah. maybe it's five, but you're taking on a lot of risk when you sell an option. <laughs> and I mean, yeah, you're just how, you know, how little are you going to get paid to take on that risk? You know, that, well, I mean, there's the, there, there's the implied ball for you, but mm -hmm. the, those, when the ball got that low, it's not that, that strategy is going to struggle. Then obviously in, in 2020 and since, Vol has just remained, you know, we've had a massive S&P rally and Vol has remained very stubbornly high. I mean, we're, we're, I don't know, but it's got to be 30% above the highs, you know, the pre-COVID crash. Yeah. And Vol is above where it was. Now, that's not unprecedented. In the mid to late 90s, the market ran and Vol ran. You know, Vol went from 12 to 16, 17. This is cash fix in the from 95 to 99 while the market went higher. And, you know, if you wanted to create a story around that, a narrative, the market is spiking up, volatile. You know, if I'm short options and hedging them, I lose just as much on an up move as a down move mm -hmm. on the gamma scalp on the gamma piece of that hedging, you know, the Vega is different, but like, if I'm going to, if I sell you an option and we both hedge it and we both hold expiration and the market moves quickly and up, I lose just as much to expiration as, as I would have on the down move. Yeah. So it could make sense. Like, Hey, we're into all time highs. We're spiking into all time highs and fast moves. I'm not, I don't want to sell you this option for nothing. Right. We've all, uh, Ben Eifert on the pod the end of last year, he's like, we also have, you know, I'm paraphrasing here, but people buying JPEGs of pet rocks for $400,000 and crypto selling off 30% in two days. And uh, all these things of like, it's not a nine vol world. Like maybe the actual vol of the S&P is, but there's risk other places that gets reflected in the S&P option price. Say right? the thing that I have noticed this year versus last year's last year. And, and this makes sense last year, there was not a lot of contango. So when a new contract was coming on, 
and you know the cash is at 20 and the the front month might be at 21. Mm -hmm. Now, and if you imagine my my hypothesis, which is people are not going to take on risk for free. Now, when they roll on, you're seeing cash at 17 and the front month future at 19 half. So you're seeing that contango build back in. Does that make sense? Yeah. The, the risk assumers are demanding that that difference to take that risk on. Now, unfortunately for those pair positions, a lot of times the market's been moving up so much and so fast, even when that contango comes in, that pair's been a loser a lot of times. So uh, that short, short kind of standard position has not done well for a number of years. Now, the total vol, by its name total vol, has other strategies in there. And, you know, everything doesn't always come out the way it's drawn up. Yeah. But, you know, it's drawn up that, hey, when this does well, these other things. So the long, long positions have done extraordinarily well. And then we do some term trades, uh, short and long VIX spreads and butterflies that have also done well. Uh, we also have a short-term um, strategy in within the total vol that, that does buy the S&P, and it did very well in 2019, you know, actually the exact year it should have done very well, the year that the market went parabolic. And that's in a day trade? It's a in less than a week trade, one okay. to six days. And it, it again is analyzing the VIX term structure. And we just, I mean, this is the most predictive strategy we have, which is something that we generally try to stay away from. But we found a VIX term structure that was strongly suggested a good time to be long, a better than random time to be long the market, I think is the fairest way to put it. Uh, and that's hedged on the other side? Like they'll oh, be that is just an outright S&P long. Okay. But does it typically go on when there's long VIX also somewhere in the portfolio? Well, it would okay. typically go on. I mean, you can get it a lot of times. Most of the times it gets on, it's going to come on is when vol is really low. Yeah. And then, then that sort of makes sense. Like, okay, vol's really low. We're better to take the directional trade than the- This the, is when the directional, you know, and a lot of times it will, it will trigger- on a media, you know, small medium break from low low vol. So vols at nine or ten, the market breaks, I don't know, two percent over two or three days. And and we'll get this type of this version of a signal in that kind of scenario. Got it. That makes sense. Um, yeah. And we then, have all these strategies, and the idea is by combining these different strategies that each one is pretty good on its own, hopefully we'll have like, oh, this isn't working, but this is working. This isn't working, but this is doing okay. And that they can net together some nice years. And they but and but they all run independently of one another and they're they're firing their signals when they get their they're firing their signals are on, you know, we cannot they they can't the term trades, the the Pair trade and the long S and P trades cannot be on at the same time. Got it. Yeah. So you would not want a long S and P and short pair. That would just leave you short VIX. Yeah. So yeah. that's not something we're going to do. So that's total vol. So the next uh, strategy we have is called hedged equity. And so when we looked at the total vol trades, what we saw was, hey, the very best trades we get are long vol, long pairs. Those amounts of backwards can get giant. Mm -hmm. And that long, you know, December of 18, there was a long, long pair that, you know, I think the cash is 25 and the future is 35 with, I don't know, 10 days left, let's call it. That's $10,000 a contract. 
now you're talking about a really big cushion. Yeah. Does that make sense? You know, at the time, I think the ratio is two to one. So for every S&P, I've got $20,000 of VIX cushion. That's a lot of S&P points. So when we looked at that, we said, you know what? Those long vol trades do great when the market is tanking. Why don't we strip those out and add them to an equity portfolio? Then we can leverage each a little bit and maybe create an interesting program. Yeah, get a rebouncing effect. And you can, you know, you can potentially, when stuff goes well, you're going to get a positive gamma scalp in your rebalancing. So uh, we launched that proprietarily beginning of or the December of 19 and started taking customer money in in August of 20. And so that is a program we like a lot. Uh, we it is designed to be a, a better mousetrap for having a long, long cap, large cap equity exposure. Yeah, which makes the, there's a long list of people who've been pairing now equities with their alts, and it just makes me more and more nervous that the S and P's time is up. <laughs> that it's going to hey, just do nothing for twenty years, and the it's going to be that Hang Sang or some other market nobody's thinking of. Yeah. You know, what we like about the long vol as a hedge is that it, it is so exponential that you can hedge a lot of S&P with a little bit of volatility. Mm -hmm. So if you think about like even a long option, if it's a put, it's got a lot of exponentiality until it gets in the money. Then it's just a future. Yeah. Right, and then, then, just... it's, then it's linear, good and bad, right? And as the market drops, it's going to decompound. So if I drop 20%, you know, if, it, if I'm at 4,000 and I drop 20%, it's an 800 point move. Then if the next month I drop 20%, it's not an 800 point move. Right. It's 80% of an 800 point move. Right, right. 640. 640, yeah. But if I'm along the VIX, Against that, the VIX is compounding. You see, and so that it gives it a lot of aspects that that we think are tremendous for a hedge. And what what do you view as like the cost of that hedge versus the S and P? Right, like if I just did rolling puts, you know, and bought them every thirty days and rolled them, I might be paying four to eight percent a year or something. Um, more than that, but yeah, yeah. whatever the number I think is. A, uh, I looked at it today, a one year at the money is a little under a year, 353 days, a one year at the money costs seven and a half percent at the money. Yeah. Sorry. I was talking like 20% out of the money, but 20% down, oddly enough, I looked at that today too, 20% <laughs> down put for a year costs two and a half percent. It's a bargain. S and P what the lifetime returns are eight. So you're limiting yourself to the 22 and a half percent loss and giving up over a quarter of the profits. Mm, right. That's listen, that's a lot more. We're glad our houses don't cost that much to insure. Like <laughs> that's expensive. Yeah. The great, I mean, the best part, you know, the best parts of the vol are also not shockingly it's worst parts much. If I mean, way more, the, vast majority of the time, you don't have any hedge on because there's not a favorable situation in the VIX, VIX term structure. Who are you saying? In the total, total portfolio? In the hedged equity. In the hedged if equity. If I'm trading this long volatility to hedge my equity, the gross majority of the time, I'm not going to have any hedge on or very okay. little because the term structure does not indicate that it's an advice that it's a inexpensive time for insurance. Got it. And so that opens you up if there's a 9-11 event on a Sunday night and you're not in or whatever. Um, but whatever. So be it over time, you think that's a better- well, yeah. what I would generally say is 
investor, you're at that risk already. Right. <laughs> you own a million dollars of spiders. If you've got a million in, I mean, in hedge equities leverage, if you have the same amount of un- unleveraged hedge equity, it's the exact same risk you already have. Right. Minus so some you percentage. This, yeah. you, you've, you've, you know, that it wasn't hedged hasn't hurt you. It's left you where you already are. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Like, okay. Yeah. It's not a hundred one to one, but maybe it's 50 well, to one or 70 to one. Then you're still better off than you were. And here's the other side. What you, you know, the main problem with hedges is how much money they lose in up markets. Yeah. They, they get, some of them get crushed and now I got to keep reallocating money away from my stocks into these hedges and hedge equity lets you have both because we're going to use futures and liquidity that's there. Yeah. So, you know, our main argument is when you're looking at building wealth over decades, a 10% drawdown doesn't matter because it only takes 11 to get even. Even a 20% drawdown only takes 25 to get even. But a 50% drawdown takes 100 to get even. Right. At 60% drawdown, 10 more percent is 150. Right. Starts to get. When you're talking about the Malik family long term financial plan, those tens, they Good. feel scary when they're happening. They don't matter a bit. But that 50, it matters. I mean, the SP went nowhere from 2000 to 2014. Right, or especially if your kid's about to go to college or you're about to retire, or you're right, all those you figured in eight percent a year, which meant you thought you were going to quadruple in that time, right? You're at zero, so now you're t- 10, 20 years behind your retirement plan. Whoops, yeah. If that hedge can just flip one of those, doesn't have to flip them all, one of them from down 50, even to scratch, you're 15 years ahead of retirement, right. Right, right. I mean, think about the impact that has. It's massive. And that's what long equity has done, or the hedged equity program has done. And and we think it's quite possible we'll continue to do. Right. Um, this is where we probably need to add in past performance is not indicative of future. Yeah. And honestly, I'm not adding that in. Those no truer words have ever been spoken. <laughs> Yeah. So you can bold those and and everything else, period, paragraph. But I think in March, the market was down 20 in March of 20. And I think hedge equity made 40 or something. Yeah. Because the vol went berserk. Yeah. Those mixes we bought at 25, we sold at 70. And I mean, that had you hedged down to zero almost. It's perfect. What are your thoughts, change gears a little bit on all this work that's being done on tracking dealer gamma and the flows coming in and out? Do you give uh, credence to any of that? Or do you focus on it, on how you're putting your hedges on? Or you're just thinking of it as noise that's in there. You don't know. I don't know even what you're talking about, to be honest. (laughs) You do not follow. I always think about what is, you know, what is it that I think I'm doing and why do I think this is going to be profitable? Yeah. And to, to think that I'm going to analyze what you've just described better than everybody else in the world who's looking at it. I, I, I frankly know that I can't. Right. I can look at the VIX term structure and I can realize that where the VIX future is does not matter one bit to a giant pension fund that needs to hedge this equity risk. And whether they pay 1250 or 1450 for the options they're buying is somewhat immaterial. And so there's, you know, in times of panic, 
even if people are being, you know, short option people are being forced out of the market by their FCM. So there is literally no analysis thought going into it. Yeah. If that's driving these things, when we put that long pair on, it is straight arithmetic. That thing's at 35. This is at 25. It's 10,000 a contract. I'm doing two VIX for one mini S&P. So it's $20,000 a cushion. So I can tell you that was almost exactly where it was February 28th to 20. And if you may not remember, the first day of March, the market rallied 100 handles. The S&P's in? Yep. I don't remember that. And the VIX cash came off 500 points, just like you'd expect. But the VIX future came off 10. Mm. 10 points. Because there's a thousand point cushion there. And it just yeah. The next day, the market dropped a hundred and whatever points, basically the whole thing back. Mm -hmm. And the VIX cash went up a thousand. The VIX future went up 500, I mean, it's off memory, four, 500. Yeah. The market's basically where we, where it ended the month. The VIX future is up 400. So you're up that money on that side of the hedge and the gap between them had gotten even wider. Mm -hmm. So nothing is going to work all the time, you know, like, but that is a bet I'm certainly willing to make. Yeah. Yeah. It just doesn't come up that often. Um, and so is that there's total vol hedged equity? Is that it? Yes. And so we just, we do offer the long vol portion where you just take hedge equity and peel out the long vol. We offer that separately. Um, again, we've taken those trades for years. We've only offered them separate as a program. I think we've had a customer in it for like two months. Okay. And then we just... I've been trading a short premium, a short option premium program proprietarily for about a year. And we just have customer money is going to start on it tomorrow. And that goes back to the idea that implied, you know, risk insurers are not going to take on risk for free. You and I, I don't know that anybody would say, hey, if I sold a week out 30 Delta put one of them every week for the next 20 years, am I going to end up down money? Yeah. I don't know that anybody <laughs> wants that side right. of that. Bet, right? right. The only problem is the pathway. You may not like, and the path, the amount of heat you have to take may not be worth the money that you make. Right. Or you might get forced out. Table you might, limits at the casino. Now you get into, exactly. So now you get into what, in essence, any short premium model is going to want to sell premium wholesale or sell premium retail yeah. and buy reinsurance wholesale. Wholesale. Yeah, yeah. Just like an insurance company. You're going to create a little bitty portfolio insurance company. So we have taken uh, what we think are two or three steps that are going to make that path more stomachable, not the least of which is we don't sell any naked puts. So every put is every downside risk is capped. Yeah. Secondly, most of your option bankruptcies happen because of Vega, not Delta. Yeah. So um, this option, the markets crash down to it. It isn't that it's 7,000 yeah, points of the money, but the vague is blown up. Yeah. And so we handle that by A, having all the puts cap, B, trading options inside of two weeks. That means their vegas are small and manageable. Right. And this view, this is kind of like an equity replacement. Or I have like an equity profile. I look at it as... So what I do with it is I pair that with long volatility as well. Yeah. Because then I say, okay, well, what if equities stink? They just grind around and go nowhere. Oh, 
well, short premium is going to do well. Right. Now I got some. Now some I want to diversify. Up. And then I say, oh, and when this really gets blown up, this long vol is going to be a marvelous hedge is maybe too strong a word, a marvelous matchup. Yeah. Short premium program. Well, it's almost a bond replacement at that point. You're getting a yield and you have, instead of uh, credit risk, you have a, a I mean, look delta at the numbers. And- think about the numbers we just gave. The 20% down year out put is two and a half percent. Okay, so since 1926, I think there have been six years that in a calendar year, the market lost more than 20%. It can only lose 100. Yeah. So my... <laughs> Now, my problem is I can't go sell 50,000 of them. Right. That's right. Your other well, problem is you might have March 2020 when you're down 40, right, with eight months to go. So, A, as long as I haven't sold too many of them, I can just sit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can just sit. B, if I'm trading long vol, there's a decent chance I may have made some, all, or more of that money back. It's and a nice matchup. Right. And that always can, right, in theory, how do I trade long and short at the same time? It would just offset, right? That's the simplistic model in my brain is that's like too so good to be true, right? But here's the thing. Options decay. VIX futures don't. Hmm. So my long vol is in a future when it's backwards, yeah, yeah. And I'm selling something with time decay, really short term. So I'm minimizing the, ve- I'm maximizing the theta vega ratio. Right. Right. And, and, and by the way, I'm also willing to accept, hey, I'm going to have a 10% down month. Yeah. If you don't like it, honestly, if you don't like that, you should not invest in anything. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to have a 10% down month. I'm probably going to have a 20% down month. Okay. But. Yeah. So, so is your 401k probably. Right? Or, or, I mean, one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot lately is perhaps we should all be much more real about what risk return we're going to get. So someone's really going to send you 15% a year, every single year, and you never even have to take any heat. You never have a down month or quarter or year. Really? Why are they continuing to send you this money? Yeah. So the long option buyer, they get to win sometimes. But if you were starting a small business, and I said, hey, you can put in 200 grand. You can sell an at the money year out option and collect, I think it's $33,000 for it. And then once every 10 years, you're going to have to make a cash injection into this business. Right. Me too. All right. Now, can I compound it? Probably not. But that's not a bad business. And here's the other great thing. The year you take your big loser, guess how much you're going to collect on that option that year? Right. A lot more. It's just like an insurance premium. Geico doesn't insure your car. When you have a wreck and they have to pay for it, they just charge you more. Yeah. (laughs) They're really just loaning you the money to fix it. And you're going to pay them back with interest. You see what I mean? Yeah. Although I buy your nice beach house, you know, one of your nice beach houses. Yeah. It gets smacked with a hurricane. That hurricane insurance company, you didn't get one over on them. They're going to jack your rates up. Until you pay them back for that money they just lent you to rebuild your house. Yeah, or or they or they cry uncle and the government steps in. Uh. So I'd say it's very similar. A short option, a short option, and particularly puts because they're bound. I mean, you know, the S P is weird, but it's a very similar setup. Yeah, yeah you're going to get smacked, 
and you cannot be out over your skis. Right. If you're levered up, you're out of the game. You're done. Now you're out. And that's why I always hate when the guys that get blown out, they always cry. Oh, my, my clearing firm blew me out. If I'd been able to hold on three more. No, that market was going to keep going against you until you blew out. Right. Right. If you'd held on three more days, it had just been three more days worse. And then, you, <laughs> of course, they blew you out. You knew that when you started playing this game. Yeah. That you had to keep margin. And when you were getting smoked, that clearing firm had, what they're supposed to take your risk? Yeah, no. of course they blew you out. Like stop. <laughs> but the so and what would happen on the floor back in the day, right? You're prime. You're bro. They would have come down and pulled your badge, right? Absolutely, they would have yeah. said. I mean, your clearing for it would have physically come down and led you and, out. Yeah, yeah, and it you happened. Out of there. Yeah, I mean, it happened. And and so just like an insurance company who can't go insure every single house on the Gulf Coast right before hurricane season, because but they go buy reinsurance, they do other things. You can run a little portfolio insurance business. So our premium, short premium program is attempting to do the same thing. There are some very interesting, when you go and look at, at the money options, a two-day is much a four day is not twice as expensive as a two day option at the money, but down 10%, a two day option is way under half a four day. Yeah. So if you're capping the potential Delta loss on any short puts and trading small enough and trading short term enough options, with low enough Vegas, you can really harness that risk. Right. And get paid for it. And per your, right? The- and your daily decay is a little bit more because it's so short term. Now you're not going to be able to sell as many. So you've got to be thinking 10 to 12% a year after fees. And you also got to know like, look, I'm going to get smacked. There's yeah. going to be a couple months, but guess what? And that's why blowing out as an option seller is so awful because the day you're blowing out is the day you'd love to be selling the most options possible. Right. You see what I mean? Yeah, we did that autopsy on LJM. We'll put it in the show notes, but that didn't make sense to me. They were only getting like eight to 10% a year and then they lost 80 some percent, right? Like they didn't match up. They seemed like they're taking more risks than they were the return didn't match up with the risk. Well, when the vol gets too low, yeah, they, they're, you have to and, sell and more and more to keep maintain this performance. So that, you know, those are the kind of things that we're, you know, we think we're going to avoid or not yeah. do now. Yeah. It may, remains to be seen. Or but I think investors, we're, hey, we're in a 4% return environment. This right? is it. Feel or it. zero. Like, yeah. look, vol six. So, now there are other things you can sell skew. I mean, there there are there are other optiony things you can do, and I, it gets back to I want to sell insurance retail, I yeah. want to buy my reinsurance wholesale. There are a couple of very known established ways that you can do that, and and so we're going to try to take advantage of some of them. Now I also think you pair that with a long vol investment particularly when in futures, I can do both in the same account, yeah. net fees, and I don't lose liquidity. Now I think you've got, and again, a really interesting matchup of, of investments. And then the, the short premium is the equivalent to the long equity, two different ways to make money during normal times. Right. And that'll bring you a little bit of diversity rather than being all just long equity. And I'm not saying one is better than the other. I would start to argue, I think there's some academic evidence to support that more different apples is almost always better. Yeah. Um, then add some trend following back in and you really rounded it up. <laughs> I um, disagree. If you can get it for 45 basis points, have at it.
Mm-hmm. All right, favorites. Just we'll do some quick fire here. Your favorite, okay. favorite Naperville restaurant. It's a bit of a slam from a city dweller, but um, I would say Maison Sabika. Maison Sabika sounds fancy. Uh, um, it's medium fancy, kind of right. tapas kind of place. Right. The correct answer was anything besides like Applebee's or, you know, what the rest of us assume I was is gonna, suburbia. Right. That's such a layup joke. And I like to think of myself as, as funnier than that. <laughs> exactly. You avoided it. Um, and we're going to go heavy Kentucky. Your favorite Kentucky basketball player of all time. Jamal Mashburn. Oh, Jamal. Uh, he Jamal was Mash. He was unique. Uh, favorite team year. 96. The 96. Four and two. I think they had 11 NBA players on the team. They were good. Who was who was that team? Delk, McCarty, Antoine Walker, Walter McCarty, uh, Derek Anderson, mm. Ron Mercer, all played in the pros. Nazi Muhammad was on that team. He was like oh, wow. string. Jeff Shepard played a little in the pros and won the MOP of the final four, two years later, they were loaded. They had a, they had a good team. Uh, Favorite coach. Uh, Calipari. All right. Um, Was he the 96 team or no? No, that was Patino. Okay. Would have been Rick if he hadn't gone and coached Louisville, but we had that, that cut ties. Um, And I'll move off basketball favorite football player. I can only think of one Tim couch. Well, we have <laughs> Benny Snell, Josh Allen. I would probably say Josh Allen. Okay. Played the, for the Jaguars now. Went sixth or seventh in the draft. The defensive end. Yes. Josh Allen, not the quarterback. Not the mm. quarterback. He did not go to Kentucky. Yeah, he was North Dakota State or something, right? Exactly right. Um, and finally, favorite Star Wars character. Favorite Star Wars character. You know... I was a kid when the first three came out and liked them. And then I thought those middle three were terrible. Yeah, very bad. But I got to admit, those last, and I didn't see the last ones because the middle three had been so bad. They kind of came back and were pretty decent. Uh, but it's hard to get away from the Wookiee. I'll go Wookie. Chewbacca. Chewbacca. Yeah. It's hard to get away from the old school. In that He's a, um, we got to add all these up over all the hundred or so podcasts and see what the, the tally is. I think Chewbacca's perhaps in the lead. I would guess Han would win, but he's, he's close. We had a, we did family do, we did a big Marvel, like all of them all the way through. And then after that, we enjoyed it so much. We did the star Wars thing with my daughter. Who's perfect. Know, 10 through 12 as all this happens. So we did the same thing in COVID. Did you do the Marvel like in the order of release or the order that their people say, like we have a, a friend of mine's son would know. And we asked him, he's a film major at Texas. How to watch asked him, What's the order we should watch him in. And he gave us a very detailed, like this, 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 and do this. And it was fantastic. And we loved it. And, and uh, we, so we watched them all in that order and very thoroughly enjoyed it. Right. You have to, because by the end, there's like 16 characters in there. Who's this, who that? Like if you, if you're lost. And the movies are better if you know the whole arc than they are individually. Yeah, for sure. Like I can remember, I'm like, really? We got a superhero raccoon coming out. These people are desperate. But yeah. you're watching them in the arc, you're like, oh, and that is that. And like, yeah, it's it's pretty cool. And I will go Black Panther is probably my favorite Marvel character. You're right. He passed away, unfortunately. But yeah, yeah it sucks. It sucks. All right, Scott, it's been fun. Um, Thank you. Hope to see you live soon. But looks I like do. we're headed for more lockdowns here in Chicago before. Like it. Uh, but whatever. We'll see you live sooner than later. I hope so. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. The Derivative is brought to you by CME Group. CME Group is the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. For more information and educational resources about futures and options, visit cmegroup.com. You've been listening to The Derivative. Links from this episode will be in the episode description of this channel. Follow us on Twitter at rcmalt and visit our website to read our blog or subscribe to our newsletter at rcmalts.com. If you liked our show, introduce a friend and show them how to subscribe. And be sure to leave comments. We'd love to hear from you.